In this chapter, we'll deal with tricuspid stenosis. Tricuspid stenosis is obviously much less frequent than tricuspid regurgitation. It only occurs in less than 1% of the population of the United States, for example. However, it does occur in the setting of rheumatic heart disease. Approximately 15% of patients who have rheumatic heart disease also have rheumatic tricuspid stenosis. However, in reality, only 5% of these patients do have some hemodynamic sequels or symptomatic tricuspid stenosis. Still, we have to be able to diagnose it with the help of echocardiography. So concentrate once more. You're almost through the finish line. This is the last topic and the last issue we'll discuss with respect to the tricuspid valve. What is there to say about tricuspid stenosis? Well, the tricuspid valve is the third most commonly affected valve in rheumatic heart disease following the mitral and the aortic valve. In 9% of patients with rheumatic heart disease will we find tricuspid stenosis. And it is much less common, obviously, than tricuspid regurgitation. There are also congenital forms of tricuspid stenosis, but they are very rare. And we can also have a functional type of stenosis caused by tumors, in particular, myxoma of the right heart. The hallmark for the diagnosis of tricuspid stenosis is doming of the leaflets. So this is very similar as in mitral stenosis. The only difference is Doming might be difficult to see at times because the tricuspid valve is not as nicely visible and the leaflets are usually not as thick. But there are also other indirect signs of tricuspid stenosis. To understand these, we have to look at the hemodynamics of TS. The major problem in this form of valvular heart disease is the presence of a gradient between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So we have obstruction to inflow basically. And this elevates the pressure in the right atrium and therefore we see an enlarged right atrium. Now this increase in pressure also translates down into the vena cava inferior therefore we also see a large inferior vena cava. Coming back to the gradients one thing I forgot to mention we have gradients which vary with respiration. This is in contrast to the mitral valve where the gradients stay fairly constant throughout the respiratory cycle. In tricuspid stenosis, the gradients increase during inspiration because we have an increase in flow. Always consider this when you quantify the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. A very important diagnostic feature with color Doppler is the so-called candle flame sign. You can see it very nicely here in this image. What we have here is we have turbulent inflow into the right ventricle which resembles that of a candle flame. Often it is this color Doppler sign which brings your attention to the presence of tricuspid stenosis. In this patient, you would not assume that tricuspid stenosis is present because the image quality is just so bad, but with the help of Doppler, you can nicely see that there must be some form of obstruction. In addition, we also see tricuspid regurgitation, which is often combined with stenosis. Not necessarily will you see doming of the tricuspid valve. We've also seen other forms of tricuspid stenosis even with calcification of the valve. This image clip is from a 65 year old female who developed typical signs of tricuspid stenosis including peripheral edema and pleural effusions. Why she had the severe of calcification we actually don't really know. We only know that she underwent pulmonic valve valvulopathy at the age of four or five years old because she had congenital pulmonic stenosis. Maybe some form of lesion was set by the intervention at the time at the tricuspid valve. So how do we quantify the severity of tricuspid stenosis? Well, very similar as you quantify the severity of mitral stenosis. You look at the gradients. To do this, you perform post wave or and or continuous wave Doppler across the tricuspid valve. Again, use the color Doppler to guide your sample volumes. And then you record a tracing which looks something like this here. You can look at the maximum velocity and calculate the maximal gradients. Now this gradient is usually not so reliable for the assessment of the severity. It's probably better to look at the mean gradient so you trace the entire curve. And also 
look at the pressure half time, so the steepness of the curve. When you perform all these calculations, don't only do it in one beat, but do it in several beats. Not only in patients who have atrial fibrillation, but in every patient, simply because you have fairly high fluctuations in the velocity due to respiration. Another thing which is important to consider, you can overestimate the severity of tricuspid stenosis if additional tricuspid regurgitation is present, because you'll simply have more flow across the tricuspid valve. There's not very much literature that deals with the question of how to quantify tricuspid stenosis. If you, however, use the pressure halftime method, it's probably better to use 190 instead of 220 with which you divide the pressure halftime. Unfortunately, this is the only method you can use to calculate the tricuspid valve area. Planimetry simply doesn't work. Severe tricuspid stenosis is defined as a valve area below one square centimeter. Don't forget that the normal tricuspid valve is much larger than the mitral valve, so you have to have significant changes happen until you have some form of severe tricuspid stenosis. And finally, if you use the mean gradients, a gradient above 5 mm mercury would mean you have severe tricuspid stenosis. But don't forget, TR and cardiac output also play an important role with respect to the gradients. So you finally made it. You're through the finish line. We concluded the chapter on the tricuspid valve the forgotten valve, and I hope you won't forget the tricuspid valve when you image the next patient, and I'm sure you'll all be experts at assessing tricuspid valve pathologies.